Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this session on Armed Conflict and the Environment, a seminar organized by the Center for International Law at NUS and the International Committee of the Red Cross. This session will comprise opening remarks, a panel discussion, and a Q&A with audience members. During the session, please feel free to type your questions in the Q&A function that you'll find at the bottom of your Zoom window. So allow me to introduce our first opening speaker for today. His Excellency Fabrice Fillier, Ambassador of Switzerland to Singapore. Ambassador Fillier has served in the Swiss State Secretariat for International Financial Matters and in various positions in the Swiss Diplomatic Service, including the Directorate for Public International Law. Ambassador Fillier, please. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, I am honored to say a few words on this important seminar on armed conflict and the environment. Allow me to make uh, three brief remarks. First, I commend the ICRC and CIL for organizing this seminar. I believe that we live in a time where no stone can be left unturned to see how we can better protect our natural environment. If it is true that over 80% of all major armed conflicts between 1950 and 2000 took place in biodiversity hotspots that sustain around half of the world's plants and many rare species of animals, international law is surely one of those stones. Generally speaking, international humanitarian law covers the natural environment with the general protection that it grants to civilian objects. In the conduct of hostilities, the principles of distinction, proportionality, and precaution apply. More specific rules have come about. The question I'm curious to hear more about today would be, where do we go from here? Should we also explore alternative fora to promote and develop protection, such as the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework with the view of creating synergies? My second point is on Switzerland's take on the matter. I am glad to say that Switzerland is a strong believer in environmental protection during armed conflict. We feel strongly for international humanitarian law. We support promoting, clarifying and developing environmental protection in international humanitarian law. We welcome the work by the International Law Commission and the IC, ICRC, which are both based in Geneva, my home country, and contribute greatly to global affairs governance. We as Swiss feel a special responsibility to facilitate and assist their work. Third, allow me to share with you some more information on Switzerland and implementation of humanitarian law. This August, the Swiss Federal Council approved a voluntary report on the implementation of international humanitarian law. The report provides an overview of how Switzerland implements international humanitarian law. It highlights good practices, including on means and methods of warfare that can be expected to cause widespread, long-term and severe damage to natural environment. You can easily find it on internet. I would encourage all interested stakeholders to have a look at it. Switzerland would be delighted if it could inspire other countries to review and report on their implementation of international humanitarian law. Uh, with that, I pass the floor back to you um, thank you very much for your attention. 
Thank you very much, Ambassador Fillier. Our next speaker is uh, Ms. Biljana Milosevic, the head of regional delegation of the ICRC in Kuala Lumpur, where she oversees operations in Malaysia, Singapore, and Brunei. She has over 20 years of experience with the ICRC in various humanitarian and development actions, including appointments in Georgia, Israel, and the occupied territories, Iraq, and Sierra Leone. Ms. Milosevic, please. Thank you very much and good morning, good afternoon and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We are delighted to have you join us virtually today to discuss the important topic of armed conflict and the environment. We thank our co-organizers, the Center for International Law for their support, contribution and interest in the topic and very distinguished moderator ambassador at large, Professor Tommy Cole, the UN International Law Commission, whose work in this domain is well recognized, and representatives from Vietnam, Indonesia, and Switzerland for their valuable insights. And last but not least, all of you taking time today to attend this webinar. Thank you and welcome. We are assembling here today against the backdrop of global uncertainty. The world has changed drastically because of a virus that continues to knock on our doors. But more than the chaos it has caused, the COVID-19 crisis is also a grave reminder that we cannot and should never turn a blind eye to issues that could threaten the very existence of life on Earth. And this is what we are here today to discuss. As a 157 year old international humanitarian organization founded on the battlefield and now present in more than 90 countries in the world, the ICRC has witnessed firsthand the adverse effects of armed conflict on human life and the environment. The link between humans and the environment is clear. Human life is impossible without it. For example, when hostilities lead to the contamination of water, soil and land, drinking water and agricultural land becomes scarcer for those already in desperate need. Our experience has shown us time and again that when wars are waged without regard to the rules of war or international humanitarian law, it contributes to the degradation and destruction of the environment and in turn, amplifies suffering of victims and of armed conflict. Given this and the need to enhance respect for IHL, the ICRC has updated its uh, guidelines from 1994 for military manuals on protection of the environment in times of armed conflict, leading to recent pu publication of the 2020 guidelines on the protection of the natural environment in armed conflict. My colleague, Helen, who has done extensive work on this project will speak more about the guidelines in a moment. The examination of this topic is all the more crucial due to the wider implication of the degradation of the environment and its consequence on our climate and on people's vulnerability to growing climate risks. The ICRC has documented the human costs of climate change, especially felt by victims of armed conflicts in our latest report titled, When Rain Turns to Dust. To name a few, we have detailed the impact on food production, amplification of diseases, weakened healthcare services and many others. In a degraded environment, all these impacts are exacerbated. These are developing real life issues that can only be addressed with support from all stakeholders and governments globally. The panel today is important to contribute to these efforts and discussion. And on this note, and with so much to discuss, I would not keep you away from hearing from other speakers. Once again, thank you all for your participation and I very much look forward to the uh, fruitful discussions. Back to you. Thank you very much. Our third opening speaker is Dr. Nilfa Oral. She's the director of the Center for International Law. She's also a member of the International Law Commission 
as well as the governing board of the International Council on Environmental Law and the steering committee of the IUCN World Commission on Environmental Law. Nilifa, please. Thank you so much. <clears throat> as director of the Center for International Law, it is my great pleasure to welcome our distinguished speakers, our moderator, and in particular, the many participants who have registered for this event. We are absolutely delighted at the level of interest um, that we have received. And without question, we can attribute this to the topic, but also to the very high caliber of our speakers. I would also like to thank the ICRC for their interest and support in collaborating with our center uh, and in particular, I thank Sean Kang, who is also an alumnus of CIL for his efforts and the wonderful CIL team, uh, Zue Chan and Jerry Ning. Now, um, we usually, as uh, the ambassador from Switzerland uh, said, we usually associate the victims of armed conflict with the civilians and human casualty, but the environment is also a victim. Uh, indeed, this was recognized in principle 24 of the 1992 Rio Declaration that recognized that warfare is inherently destructive of sustainable development and that states shall therefore respect international law providing protection for the environment in times of armed conflict and cooperate in its further development as necessary. The environmental consequences of armed conflicts and the impacts of these on conflict affected populations has been and continues to be a concern for international community. So we are very fortunate today to have top world experts to discuss the latest developments in the law of armed conflict and protection of the environment. The webinar will present the work of the International Law Commission on this subject and the recently published guidelines by the ICRC. These will be complemented with national and military perspectives. So because we have so much to say, I'm going to save time and give very brief introductions to our panelists who uh, their profiles can be found online as well. First, we are so fortunate to have uh, Ambassador at Large Tommy Koh uh, as our moderator. He is an international law luminary known around the world and chair of the governing board of the Center for International Law. Our first speaker is a member of the International Law Commission and the Special Rapporteur for the IOC work on protection of environment in relation to armed conflict, and my very dear colleague, Ambassador Maria Leto, who herself is a seasoned diplomat, diplomat and a world expert in IHL law. Our second panelist is Hélène obregon Giesken, who is a legal advisor within the ICRC's legal division in Geneva, and she will be presenting us today on the new guidelines that have been recently issued. Our next panelist is Major General Sima Tupang, who is Commandant of the Peacekeeping Center of the Indonesian Armed Forces. And our fourth panelist is also a very dear colleague from the ILC, Professor and Ambassador Nguyen Hong Tao, who is Professor Associate in Law, Diplomatic Academy of Vietnam and the National University of Hanoi, Vietnam. And I also take this opportunity to welcome from the audience, Professor Patricia Gavalotelis, another good colleague from the International Law Commission and also co-director of the CIL Singapore Academy of International Law. Professor Ko, I turn over the floor to you now. Uh, thank you, Nilufa. Um, I, it gives me great pleasure to call on the Maria Leto to speak to us about the 28 draft principles which the International Law Commission has drafted on this topic. Uh, Maria, please. Thank you, Professor Ko, and good morning from Helsinki. I wholeheartedly thank the Center for International Law for this initiative. The CIA has an excellent record of organizing virtual lecture series, panels, and workshops that connect, in these unusual times, those working with or otherwise interested in international law. It's a great pleasure to be part of today's event. I have been asked to give an overview of the International Law Commission's current work 
on the protection of the environment in relation to armed conflicts. As you may know, a complete set of draft principles with commentaries uh, was adopted by the ILC in first reading in 2019. The ILC draft principles are still work in progress until the second reading, which has been postponed to 2022 due to the COVID-19 pandemic. States, uh, international organizations and others have been invited to submit written comments on the topic before the end of June uh, 2021. As for the background of the topic, I would like to mention that it was originally proposed to the ILC by the UN Environmental Programme back in 2009. The UNEP's request uh, contained in, the, in a joint report with the ICRC and the Environmental Law Institute was significant in at least three ways. The first, the fact that the request came from another UN body undoubtedly facilitated the quick inclusion of the topic in the Commission's active agenda already in uh, 2013. Second, the UNEP was well placed to see the discrepancy between the existing legal regulations on the protection of the environment in armed conflicts on the one hand, and the reality of destruction and degradation of the environment in conflict-affected areas on the other. The main problem identified was the lack of a coherent international legal framework for the protection of the environment and natural resources in armed conflicts. Third, it is significant that in addition to the request addressed to the International Law Commission, the 2009 report contained a recommendation to the International Committee of the Red Cross that it would begin updating its 1994 guidelines on the protection of the natural environment in armed conflicts. We'll hear more of the ICRC guidelines in Helen Obregon's presentation in a little while. Let me just say that the new guidelines make a major contribution to the clarification of the law of armed conflict in systematically going through re the relevant rules and principles and revealing the capacity of many provisions originally crafted to protect civilian populations to also provide general or indirect protection to the environment. The ILC work on its part has a different scope in that it covers all phases of the conflict life cycle, from measures to be taken before an armed conflict breaks out, to armed conflicts and post-conflict situations. Closely related to this broad focus, the ILC work on the topic has also drawn from other areas of international law, in addition to international humanitarian law, in particular, environmental law and international human rights law. Both the guidelines and the draft principles share the same fundamental aim of clarifying the international law applicable to the prevention and remediation of conflict-related environmental harm. With the different approaches and this shared objective I believe it can be safely said that the two documents are both complementary and mutually supportive. As mentioned, the IOC's draft principles on the protection of the environment in relation to armed conflict are not limited to situations of armed conflict, but seek to cover the whole conflict cycle. The purpose, in other words, is to enhance the protection of the environment before, during, and after armed conflicts. Before co conflict, we speak of precautionary measures and prevention, including legislative measures and international agreements, such as those for the purpose of designating a protected area. 
after an armed conflict. Issues of responsibility, restoration and compensation require particular attention. But it's equally important to ensure that environmental grievances do not prevent a development towards sustainable peace. The draft principles applicable during armed conflicts recognize the inherently civilian nature of the environment and include an environmental Martens clause. They also reflect some of the specific IHR rules, such as Articles 35, 3 and 55 of Additional Protocol 1 to the Geneva Conventions, which protect the natural environment from widespread long-term and severe damage. Most of the 28 draft principles uh, nevertheless focus on environmental harm below that high threshold, including harm that is caused inadvertently or by negligence, harmful practices, or harm caused by other actors than the parties to a conflict. The principles thus deal with peace operations, humanitarian assistance, protection of the territories of indigenous peoples, and regulation of corporations and other business entities. Behind this broad approach is the, is the recognition that environmental damage in conflict results from a great number of factors that are not only or even most often related to the conduct of hostilities. To begin with, uh, armed conflicts may seriously impair the environment, pollute air, water and soil, affect ecosystems and biodiversity, for instance, by the simple presence or movement of armed forces in vulnerable environments, or by leaving behind unexploded ordnance, toxic and hazardous remnants. All these issues are addressed in the set of draft principles, which inter alia seek to, seeks to diminish the environmental footprint of peace operations and to ensure the same for pre-conflict agreements regarding military presence. A common problem in resource-rich countries is that looting of natural resources is accelerated in situations of armed conflict and tends to prolong conflicts. According to the UN Environmental Programme, 40% of internal armed conflicts over the past 60 years were related to natural resources, and since 1990, at least 18 armed conflicts have been fueled directly by natural resources. Armed conflicts are also increasingly part of global environmental crime. Altogether, five draft principles are relevant to the protection of natural resources from environmentally harmful or unsustainable exploitation and address this question from different angles. I will go briefly through them. First, the prohibition of pillage is an established customary rule applicable in international and non-international armed conflicts, protecting all natural resources that can be subject to ownership and constitute property. In situations of occupation, the prohibition of pillage forms an absolute limit to the exploitation of the natural resources of an occupied territory by the occupying power. At the same time, the draft principles relative to occupation take into account more long-term environmental degradation linked to harmful occupation practices. One of them seeks to protect the natural resources of the occupied territory from excessive and unsustainable use. Two further draft principles on corporate due diligence and corporate liability are relevant in the context of illegal exploitation of natural resources in conflict-affected areas, 
given the role that corporations and business enterprises may have in perpetuating conflict economies and in causing environmental harm. While corporations often make a positive contribution to post-conflict reconstruction, there are examples of excessive exploitation, harmful to the environment and human health. These two draft principles uh, address the legislative and other measures that states can take with a view to ensuring that corporations and their subsidiaries exercise environmental due diligence and can be held liable when they cause harm to the environment. The last draft principle in this cluster uh, addresses the inadvertent effects of conflict-induced human displacement. Population displacement is a typical consequence of the outbreak of an armed conflict, and one that may give rise to significant human suffering as well as environmental damage. The latter mainly related to the use of natural resources for food and shelter. Let me add that illegal and unsustainable exploitation of natural resources, as well as the inadvertent environmental effects of displacement, have been recognized as being among the main pathways for environmental harm in non-international armed conflicts. Regarding accountability for environmental harm, the draft principles restate the general rule that an internationally wrongful act of a state entails its international responsibility and gives rise to an obligation to make full reparation. They reaffirm the applicability of this rule in relation to armed conflicts and in relation to environmental damage, including pure environmental damage. At the same time, there are a number of draft principles that complement this fundamental rule and address the issue of remediation from a pragmatic point of view. These are related to sharing of and granting access to environmental information, post-conflict environmental assessments and remedial measures, as well as relief and assistance. Most notably, uh, these draft principles are not only addressed to the parties or former parties to, to a conflict, but also to other states or international organizations that are in the position to provide information or remedy. What is at stake? The aim of the draft principles is to contribute to a more coherent legal framework for protecting the environment of conflict-affected areas. What the Commission has proposed to states is our take of relevant international law and practice. At the same time, uh, first reading is a concept that underlines the importance of the interaction between the Commission on the one hand and states and other stakeholders on the other. It means that the Commission has adopted the whole set of draft principles, but only provisionally. The second reading in two years' time will take place in the light of the comments received. I should add that a great many of the 28 draft principles built on existing or emerging practice by states or international organizations. It can be hoped that the finalization of the principles will be an inclusive process. This could ensure that the final product is useful from the point of view of enhancing the protection of the environment in relation to armed conflicts and may influence future legal developments. I thank you for your attention. I thank Maria for a very clear presentation on the draft principle. I also thank you for helping me to understand the relationship between these draft principles on the one hand 
and the ICRC guidelines on the other. I recall your remark that the two are complementary and mutually reinforcing, but different. Uh, thank you, Maria. I, before I call on the next speaker, I want to say that, that I'm an, an admirer of ICRC. I think ICRC has played an indispensable role in the development, promotion, and observance of international humanitarian law. In an early part of my career, I served as an advisor to ICRC. And I also want to say that when I was drafting the ASEAN Charter, I managed to persuade my colleagues to insert in the Charter a provision that ASEAN respects international humanitarian law. So Helen, uh, your turn, please. So good morning, uh, your excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, of course, depending on, on where you are tuning in from. Uh, it is a great honor for me to be here uh, and be part of this event with such a distinguished group of speakers. And I would like to warmly thank our co-organizers, the Center for International Law, and our moderator, Ambassador-at-Large, Professor Tommy Po. In the next minutes, I would like to provide an overview of the International Committee of the Red Cross's work on the protection of the environment in armed conflict, and in particular on our updated guidelines, uh, which we see as complementary to the important work that we have just heard about from Her Excellency Maria Leto. So before going into sort of the, the, the content uh, of this presentation, I did want to say a few words um, and add to what we have already heard um, in the opening remarks about why this is important and why is the ICRC working on this issue and why do we consider that action is needed now more than ever to strengthen the protection of the environment in war. So as we've heard already, the environment um, can be lastingly scarred by war. And we have seen this in past conflicts, but we continue to see it in conflicts today. Explosive remnants of war remain etched into landscapes, causing contamination, and biodiversity can be irreparably degraded as warfare is fought in hotspots. In some circumstances, such environmental consequences can also contribute to climate change. The consequences of this environmental damage for conflict-affected populations who depend on the environment for food, for water, for livelihoods, is severe and complex. Impacts of this environmental damage often persist for years or decades after wars end and threaten the well being, the health, and even the survival of these populations. When environmental degradation collides with climate risks, it makes matters worse for civilians uh, and populations trying to survive in contemporary armed conflict. The combined impacts of conflict have added new urgency to the ICRC's work. And here, Biljana also mentioned our important report um, on the effects of, uh, on the links between conflicts, uh, climate, and environmental degradation. So what, uh, what can be done? And what are the ICRC's, uh, what is the ICRC's contribution to wider ongoing efforts uh, at the international and national level on this? It is clear that a certain amount of environmental damage may be inherent to war, but it cannot be unlimited. And this is where international humanitarian law and other branches of law come in. Although IHL does not address all environmental impacts, it does contain rules that provide protection to the environment and that seek to limit the damage caused to it by armed conflict. But as we have heard, it is only one part of a wider network of rules that protect the environment and that need to be respected in order for the protection of the environment to be improved. 
But of course, as the guardian of IHL, we have been, the ICRC has been um, involved in the promotion of the need to enhance respect for IHL rules, protecting the natural environment since the early 90s. And to step up our efforts on this today, um, we released in September uh, our updated guidelines on the protection of the envir natural environment in armed conflict, which set out 32 rules and recommendations relating to the protection of the natural environment under international humanitarian law. So to provide very quickly some background, as uh, Biljana mentioned already, uh, in 1994, the ICRC issued guidelines to assist the training and instruction of armed forces on these IHL rules. And this was in a response to a request by the UN General Assembly and following consultations with international experts. These guidelines were then submitted to the UN and a General Assembly resolution invited states to disseminate them widely and to consider the possibility of incorporating them into their military manuals and other instructions. Almost 30 years later, as we've heard, we still see the devastating consequences of war on the environment and the impact that this has on populations living in conflict. This obviously highlights a need to reaffirm and enhance respect for IHL and other rules protecting the natural environment. At the same time, in these last 30 years, the international legal framework has continued to develop. As a result, and in line as mentioned by, by Ambassador Leto, with a recommendation from a 2009 ICRC and United Nations Environment Program, the ICRC has updated its 1994 guidelines to reflect developments in treaty and customary law. In parallel to this, efforts to clarify and strengthen the legal framework have continued, as, as we've heard, and of note, we warmly welcome the International Law Commission's ongoing work, which is of significant importance. And we warmly congratulate the Special Rapporteur for the adoption on first reading of the full set of draft principles. As mentioned, we see this work as complementary to the ICRC's updated guidelines, and I would say in two key ways. First, as has also been mentioned, the scope of the ILC draft principles is broader, both in temporal scope, uh, in terms of looking at before, during, and after armed conflict, but also in regards to the branches of public international law from which they draw. The second and critical point is that the draft principles reflect and affirm the application of IHL to the natural environment. So we hope that the updated guidelines will be a resource to states and other actors as they consider relevant elements of the ILC's draft principles during the ongoing consultation process. And we very much look forward to continuing to engage with the ILC throughout these consultations and thereafter. So going now into the ICRC's updated guidelines uh, in, in more detail, what are these? Um, what is their scope? The updated guidelines, of, as I've already hinted, like the 1994 version, focus on how IHL protects the natural environment. But they do briefly recall other international law rules that may continue to apply in armed conflicts. As their first version, the guidelines reflect the current state of IHL and do not aim to create or develop obligations. They are in this way a collection of existing rules and recommendations that protect the environment in war under IHL. To facilitate the implementation of the guidelines, we have added a concise commentary to accompany each rule or recommendation to aid understanding both of the source of this rule and of its applicability. The 2020 guidelines underwent a process of external peer review by practitioners and academics who contributed input in their personal capacity. And here I would like to take the opportunity to thank very warmly Ambassador Maria Leto for being part of this process. So what is the purpose of the updated guidelines? 
we see them as a reference tool for states, parties to armed conflict, and other actors who may be called upon to promote, implement, apply, and enforce IHL. They are intended to facilitate the adoption of concrete IHL implementation measures, including by incorporating these rules into military manuals, national policy, and legal frameworks. So before looking in detail at the content, what are two key takeaways of these guidelines? First, it is generally recognized today that by default, the natural environment is civilian in character. On this basis, all parts of the natural environment are civilian objects unless parts of it become military objectives. As such, its various parts are covered by general IHL rules protecting the uh, civilian objects. Second, there are also a number of specific IHL rules that must be applied uh, for the protection of the environment. So in this way, IHL contains important rules uh, that protect the environment. And this is what the 2020 guidelines look at in detail. So what is the content? What is in the guidelines? To start, the updated guidelines address the notion of the natural environment under IHL. And for the purposes of the guidelines, it is understood to con constitute, and here I quote, um, the natural world together with the system of inextricable interrelations between living organisms and their inanimate environment in the widest sense possible. The guidelines then address general questions related to IHL and the interaction with other branches of international law. After these initial considerations, the guidelines go into the first type of IHL protection, which consists of the rules that grant specific protection to the natural environment as such. They are set out in part one of the guidelines and include rules on prohibition of means and methods of warfare that may cause widespread long-term and severe damage to the natural environment, as well as the prohibition of attacking the natural environment by way of reprisal. Part two of the guidelines then set out the second broad type of protection, which consists of general IHL rules that protect the natural environment without this being their specific purpose. These crucial rules have to some extent been overlooked and at times underapplied. They include the general protections granted to all parts of the environment as civilian objects by the principles of distinction, proportionality, and precautions, but also protections provided by rules on specially protected objects, for instance, prohibitions regarding objects indispensable to the survival of the civilian population, as well as protections afforded by rules on enemy property. The guidelines then cover in part three, the general protections provided by rules on specific weapons. This includes, for instance, prohibitions of using biological and chemical weapons, but also rules on minimizing the impact of explosive remnants of war. Finally, part four of the guidelines look at rules on respect for implementation and dissemination of IHL rules protecting the natural environment. And this includes rules related to the repression of war crimes and the obligation to provide instruction to the armed forces on IHL. So in closing, it is of course not enough that IHL rules exist on paper. For their protective effect to be seen on the ground, we must now move towards better promotion, implementation and application of these. With the release of the guidelines, we are stepping up our efforts to raise awareness and to enhance respect for IHL rules protecting the natural environment. To support implementation of these rules and of the guidelines, uh, the ICRC proposes four key recommendations to states with the aim of reducing environmental impacts of war. And these include disseminating IHL rules and integrating them into armed forces doctrine, 
education, training, and disciplinary systems, adopting measures to increase understanding of the effects of armed conflicts on the environment. This can include, for instance, mapping areas of particular important environmental importance, and this critically is to, to minimize the impact of military operations. Identifying and designate areas of particular environmental importance, including national parks as demilitarized zones, and also exchanging good practices on measures that can be taken to comply with IHL obligations, and this can be through conferences, military training, and exercises. At the recent, at the last International Conference of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement in December of last year, states and national societies of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement submitted a number of pledges to improve the protection of the natural environment in war. Efforts like these to implement the legal protections afforded to the natural environment under IHL must continue. In this time of climate and environment crisis, the ICRC is ready to work with states, parties to armed conflict, and other actors to strengthen the protection of the environment. As part of these efforts, we ask states to incorporate the guidelines into military manuals, national policy, and legal frameworks. But more importantly, we hope that they will be applied in practice to limit the impacts of conflict on the environment and prevent the deeply interlinked consequences for conflict-affected populations. The environment can no longer remain a silent casualty of war. And I thank you very much uh, for, for uh, allowing me uh, to say these words, and I'm happy to answer any questions during the Q&A period. Uh, thank you, Helen, for a very, very good presentation. <clears throat> we will now hear from two colleagues from two important countries, Indonesia and Vietnam. I will next call upon Major General Victor Sumatupang to speak to us. Pa Victor, please. Thank you very much. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Can. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, dear Dr. Oral, Ambassador Filet, Ambassador Koch, Ambassador Lethal, Professor Nguyen, Madam Milosevic, Madam Giskin. Um, distinguished panelists and participants. Before starting my presentation, I would like to begin with a short video. Please enjoy it for one minute. Again, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity, and it is a great honor to speak here today. My focus on this webinar is on training of troops and UN personnel deployed in the mission area and best practices from Indonesian contingent in the mission area and conclusions. The training of UN peacekeeping staff and troops serving in operations is the responsibility of both Department of Peace Operation and Department of Operational Support, and member states providing the troops. 
long before 2017, when the UN Integrated Training Service shared between DPO and DOS integrated environmental issues into training programs. Indonesian Defense Forces peacekeeping training as one of the Indonesian National Armed Forces Organization responsible for recruiting and training of peacekeepers includes raising awareness of environmental issues among peacekeepers into pre-deployment training activities. The organization cannot provide training on everything and the environment issues is considered more a matter of awareness raising than training. Nevertheless, the 2017 core pre-deployment training materials available in the New Technician Peacekeeping Resources Hub, including a lesson in module number three, dedicated to environment and natural resources. This lesson integrates questions of missions, environmental impact, and environmental footprint and issues relating to the role of natural resources in conflict and peace building. Since then, Indonesian Peacekeeping Center incorporates as appropriate environmental guidelines and environmental issues into our training programs for military personnel in preparation for deployment to United Nations peacekeeping operations. Training models for United Nations troops and personnel in specific areas can improve current practices as well as the lasting impacts of missions on local communities and the environment. Um, ladies and gentlemen, best practice and lesson learned from deployed troops and staff. There is a series of success story or illustrative example to show the concrete activities implemented by Indonesian peacekeepers to reduce UN peace operations environmental footprint. They are mostly small or large scale activities meant to highlight lessons learned and best practices. Indonesian peacekeepers also involved in peak impact projects to carry out civilian military activities for the benefit of the population during operation, including distribution of drinking water, building water pumping, community group, planting trees and landfill clearing. All activities conducted to show how Indonesian peacekeepers assist United Nations environment in reducing environmental risks while bringing benefits to civilians who are affected by armed conflict and enhancing environmental protection. Following our views, samples of Indonesian peacekeepers' best practice and lessons learned deployed in UN mission area. Best practice from MINUSCA, engaging communities to protect the environment. Indonesian engineer company assigned to the United Nations multidimensional integrated stabilization mission in Central Africa play important roles advocating for improvements in environmental management and engaging communities to protect the ecosystem. The Indonesian engineer company as part of Earth Day on 22nd April 2018 participated in cleanup and tree planting activities organized by the MINUSCA in school located in the 7th district of Bangui. An activity in the college Eta de Habit mobilized students, MINUSCA peacekeepers, and local community to work together to remove plastic waste and planting trees. Our engineer company also planting trees around their headquarters. The head of MINUSCA Environmental Unit, Ms. Georgia Michelle Salutes, testifies on positive contribution of Indonesian engineer company. Indonesian engineer company is always among the first to engage the environmental initiatives and to help to improve MINUSCA's environmental footprint. Partnership between the peacekeepers and the environment units have continued with other events, such as the week of activities in June 2018 for World Environment Day. One of our unit for sanitation project for the capital in uh, Bangui. Best practice from RDB Molusco, Indonesian military staff participated in brainstorming session on climate action in Tanganyika province. Molusco, through public information section organized on 25th September 2019, a debate around the theme, climate change, environmental consequences, and populations. Living condition in Tanganyika province 
the activity is part of the commemoration of the International Day of Peace celebrated on 21st September. The audience included members of provincial assembly, heads of provincial technical services for the Department of Agriculture, fisheries, livestock, environment, and surveying and land registry, members of Congolese National Police, traditional chiefs, JRP students, members of various groups, fishermen, women's groups in change of public sanitation, many young people as well as MONUSCO military staff officer. Participants stressed the need for behavior change that would facilitate protection of environment and safeguarding of the natural resources in the province, referring to Lake Tanganyika and forest. Dissemination and application of the legal instruments and laws in the environmental area are also part of their recommendations. As a short-term action, participants demanded more awareness raising targeting youth in particular. Best practices from UNAMID. In February 2016, the UNAMID sector was refurbished two other hand pumps near El Nakel and the internally displaced person camp, grinding number two in El Janina. The project included indoor plumbing in the El Janina, El Shati and El Tijaria secondary schools, construction of two underground water tanks in Adamata prison, and construction and furnishing of El Humaria kindergarten school in Adamata. These quick impact projects were initiated by the Indonesian Battalion of Peacekeeping Force and is expected to supply portable water to hundreds of area, planting trees around Indobat compound as well as the area of Ejedina with local. Ladies and gentlemen, best practice from UNIFIL. UNIFIL Head of Mission and Force Commander Major General Stefano Del Co started a major afforestation campaign in, in the missions area of operation in southeastern Lebanon on 11 February 2020. Indonesian peacekeepers participated in the plantation campaign to be implemented by the missions Indonesian peacekeepers started from the main base of Unifil Indonesian Battalion to Addis al Qasir, and we continue until March end. During the campaign, trees and sapping of Trembesi, orange, pomegranate, and apple will be planted. The administration drive seeks to build a cleaner and greener world, as well as environmentally enriched Lebanon, in line with the UN Sustainable Development Goal number 15, which aims to protect, restore, and promote sustainable use of terrestrial ecosystems, sustainably manage forests, and help and reverse land degradation and help biodiversity loss. Ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, I would like to re-emphasize a viewpoint as follows. <clears throat> While we, Indonesian Peacekeeping Center, focuses on UN peace operations, environmental concerns and practices is one of our main activities, even though as a cross-cutting issue, it does, it does touch upon much of what we do. Yet, despite being less central to the core mandate of peace operation, environmental problems echo the do no harm principle to deserve greater attention because of their potential destructive effects as unintended consequences. Member states and the FS should focus on three main areas. Energy by providing concern to focus more energy efficiency and on renewable energy when feasible, water and wastewater, by supporting projects to install and operate all treatment plants without any risk and to monitor groundwater. And the last, solid waste management, an area that so far has no dedicated positions by appointing waste management officers in engineering section in charge of the designing and managing unit infrastructure. I thank you very much and I'm very happy to answer your question.
Thank you very much, General Sumatupang, for your statement. Our final speaker is uh, a member of the International Law Commission from Vietnam, uh, Professor Nguyen Hong Tao. Professor Nguyen, you have the floor. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, good morning and uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you, Professor Tomiko. Uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you to Center for International Law, National University of Singapore, and International Committee of the Red Cross for giving me the opportunity to have a comment on armed conflicts and the environment matter. After that, I would like also to only congratulate the finalization of the ongoing work of the International Law Commission under the title of Protection of the Environment in relation to armed conflict. It's the right decision of the Commission to appoint the two women as special reporters, Professor Maki Jacobson and Ambassador Marshalletto to this hard and delicate uh, topic. I fully support uh, the comment on the update uh, ICRC guideline made by other women, Helen Obregon. And it is, generally speaking, it is still says that women are symbol of peace loving and sticking with nature. My colleagues have uh, treated and integrated quite a different area of international law, law of war, environment law, international human rights law, humanitarian law, and state responsibility is the topic. I LSC 2019 draft recipient in conjunction with the report of the UN Environment Programme in 2009 and the update 2020 ICRC guideline has made a solid ground for the qualification and progressive development of international law on the matter of protection of the environment during armed conflicts. As you know, the Southeast Asia is a region that has been having high possibility of armed conflicts. From the history, every member state of ASEAN, except for Thailand, got independence from state outside the region and survive in time of conflict. Nature and resources are one of the root causes of regional armed conflict. Conflict to gain military advantage have polluted water and soil and narrowing the forest area as well as killing many children and animals. Armed conflict operation can cut out the landfill process water supply system. Over the past of more 30 years of armed conflicts, Vietnamese environment, including land, forest, water, air, ecosystem, were destroyed and deteriorated, negatively impacting people's life, their livelihood and health. The protection of environment now is a great concern of a regional state. It becomes more urgent when ASEAN stay under the slogan of one vision, one identity, and then one caring and sharing communities. The association has the experience to recognize that peace, development, and environment protection are independent and indivisible. Read us in way, go in line with the approach to protect environment in all three temporal phases, before, during, and after armed conflicts. The common priority of protection of environment is to avoid any armed conflict, notwithstanding international or non-international land reclamation activity, for example, that has harm coral reefs in the South China Sea, must be restrained and stopped. If the armed conflict is uh, unavoidable, so the mitigation of damage and harm effect to the environment and people's life must be an obligation of all competents, regular or irregular, relevant non-state actors, corporation and other business enterprise, enterprise operating in the area of armed conflict. It is necessary to have a clear identification of widespread long-term and severe damage to environment. It should take care of the fact that any damage to the environment is long-term and invisible 
the protection of environment must be priority in peacetime, in time of armed conflict, and also in the restoration process. Uh, ASEAN has uh, actively been celebrating every November 6th at the International Day to prevent the exploitation of natural resources in war since 2001. ASEAN support to restate the obligation on provision of beliefs of natural resources. In reality, it is a rule of customary law codified in several international conventions to protect the natural resources of occupied state. It is complementary to the principle of permanent sovereignty over natural resources of occupied state, even in the case of temporary deprivation of its control. The objective of those measures is not only limited to end the beliefs, but also to restrain the illegal trade and exploitation of plundered resources of occupied state that go against the right of self-determination of population in the area of armed conflict. Generally speaking now, armed conflict have adversely affected the environment of the territory that people inhabit. The protection of environment in armed conflict, in my opinion, has a final purpose of protection of vulnerable people, especially indigenous children and women. In 2019, children continue to be victims of war and conflict in many parts of the world. And this situation is uh, exacerbated in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic during the term of non-permanent member of the UN Security Council 2020-2021. Vietnam raised red matter in the UN framework calling on the warring party to implement ceasefires to facilitate humanitarian assistance. My streaming child rights and protection in armed conflict and post-conflict reconstruction and early ratification of the additional protocol of the ICIC, ICIC Convention on Children in Armed Conflict. Uh, <clears throat> so point that uh, the last the, the lack of the uniform and consistent state of practice on the use of environmental modification techniques to impair environment and human habitat of adversary for military purpose does not necessarily deny the obligation of the prohibition of military or any other hostile use of environmental modif modification techniques. Uh, modification of environment in negative way uh, without adequate control can damage the environment of more than one state or bring about terrible and irreparable consequences to the international environment as a whole. So in contemporary time, it is rich that non-state actors are capable to own also the modern environmental modification techniques and use them in bad way. So that the obligation of the provision of military or any other hostile use of environmental modification techniques must be applied in any case, regardless of the nature of the armed conflict, international or non-international. You know that ASEAN has a South Asia nuclear weapon free zone treaty. Vietnam is also one of the first 10 states in the lead of ratification of the Treaty on Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons in 2018 when it opened for ratification. Many states of ASEAN are members of the Biological Weapon Convention 1972 and Chemical Weapon Convention 1993 show. <clears throat> It is uh, no doubt that a more convention must be ratified by all members of the ASEAN. I know that uh, <clears throat> in the post-conflict period, country need to pay attention to environmental assessment, restoring the devastated environment, thereby helping 
people to stabilize their life early and maintain sustainable development. Asian orange cause a serious consequences for people and the environment in Vietnam. Currently, up to 3 million Vietnamese are victims of Asian orange. Hundreds of thousands of hectares of land are contaminated with dioxin. Overcome the consequences of Asian orange require a lot of resources and time. Remedy and reparation payment are useful are impressive to the victim of armed conflict. Those measures have overcome hostilities and contribute to the restitution process of environment affected during and post uh, armed conflict. However, you know that states are reluctant to accept the international wrongful acts. The Vietnamese experience shows that even we shall being acknowledged officially responsibility and liability to environment and damage in those cases are most effectively carried out through the mental sentiment of parties involved in armed conflict to silence uh, admit the wrongful act. Uh, the case of uh, environment cleanup of Da Nang and Bien Hoa Airport, Vietnam from Asian orange to six substance conducted by uh, Americans and Vietnamese staff serve a valuable example. We work together to clean up the Asian orange from the airports. Uh, so now that uh, the protection of environment in the three temporal phases of armed conflict requires the full observance of international law by state, non-state actors, international organizations in keeping balance of the law of armed conflicts and the law of environmental protection. Some relevant initiative can be suggested. Uh, first, in my opinion, it should promote the systematic assessment to identify the main environmental issues of the conflict to arise and to identify also the most sensitive area, have a smarter plan of preventing the conflict that can create environmental change. Second, international environment cooperation must be strengthened, notably through the exchange of data and practical information and providing financial support to the population. On the basis of uh, Vietnam's commitment and decade of uh, practice in our national liberation, uh, Vietnam is ready to cooperate and share experience in the field. And third, uh, regional military manual must be adopted to aim at the reduction of the impact of military operation on the environment. At use uh, eco military equipment and at uh, limitation of modern environmental modification techniques. Uh, fourth, uh, it's a uh, not least <coughs> protection of environment. Uh, closely linked with the protection of people, especially indigenous women and children facing armed conflict. Uh, so uh, I, I thank you uh, for the attention. I, <clears throat> I thank Professor Nguyen uh, for a very moving statement. I think that uh, the damage done during the war to the environment in in Vietnam is one of the compelling reasons why the world needs to take action. <clears throat> so we now, we now enter the Q&A session. I've asked, um, I've asked Suwe to help me. I think we've received many questions, 17 questions. Uh, I can't read them all. So Suwe, can you do us a favor? Can you read to, to the panel uh, one of the questions that you have identified for us to, to answer. Certainly, Ambassador. Um, and perhaps I would leave it to you to perhaps designate which of the panelists might be more okay. suitable for the question. Um, perhaps we can start with some uh, a more general question. Let me just find this one now.
Uh, this is a question from Matis Martins. How likely are these principles to be followed in the event of armed conflict? And what are the consequences if they are not? Um, I, th I think maybe I can answer and, and say that the principles are not yet law. They are draft principles and they've just been adopted in the first reading. As Maria told us, they are now seeking inputs and there'll be a second reading of the 28 draft principle in two years time, 2022. So there, there's, still, there's still several steps before they will eventually be embodied in some kind of a draft treaty. So they are not, not, they do not have the force of law. In the case of the ICRC guideline, these guidelines are intended for the armed forces of the world, for these guidelines to be incorporated in the training of the armed personnel. I think that maybe answer that question. So can we have another question, please? Um, perhaps in a related vein, there's a question from Al Cook. Are there current examples in Southeast Asia of militaries integrating earlier guidelines of IHL and environment into military doctrine, training and national frameworks? I guess the question is also like, how likely do we think it is that uh, the, the draft principles will, will be taken up? Um, I, I think it's, it's premature, Suwe, to talk about um, the country taking up this draft principle because, as I say, the draft principles are not yet law. They are in the process of being uh, becoming law. So maybe we should talk about the guideline. Yeah? I, I think Indonesia, maybe I'll ask General Sumatupang to reply to this. If I'm not wrong, uh, the Indonesian Armed Forces already incorporate the ICRC guidelines in their training. And uh, General Sumatapang gave us examples of Indonesian peacekeepers uh, working in, the, in various parts of Africa where they have tried to repair damage to the environment by tree planting, making available fresh water and so on. Uh, General, can I ask you to comment on this question? RC in Indonesia to, uh, to, to train our troops who are going abroad. Uh, normally on the pre deployment training, we ask them to come to our uh, institution here to train them. Uh, if you see my uh, explanation on my uh, PowerPoint, we, 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 we did best practice uh, in, the, in the mission area. So on that focus, maybe you can take uh, the good example of Indonesia. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, General. Uh, Tsui, let's, let's have a more challenging question, please. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see if, if this one uh, turns out to be of interest. There's a question from Hanouf al Haza. Could you please explain the role of non-state actors on protecting the environment during armed conflict under international law? What if an armed group refuses to allow, for example, the removal of an oil ship that may cause catastrophic disaster to the environment, block the UN's help. Is there anything in international law that can push an international community to act in accordance with international law to protect the environment? So I invite uh, Maria Leto and also um, Professor Nguyen uh, to reply to this question, which is, would the draft principle apply to non-state actors as well? Because in, in many of the conflict today, you, it's not a conflict between two states, but very often between um, armed groups which are not uh, formally armies. You know? So the question is, what, what is the role of, uh, of these groups? Maybe everybody should answer it. Let me just go around and start with, with Maria. <clears throat> Thank you very much. And if you allow, I would also briefly comment on the earlier questions. Um, you are completely right in that uh, the IOC work is uh, still pending the, before the second reading. But I believe that the work has already contributed to sensitizing states to the environmental impact of conflicts. 
and to the relevance of the international environmental obligations, even in situations of occupation or armed conflict. As you know, uh, the ILC annually reports to the UN General Assembly and gets regular feedback from states. Those, so there has been this, this dialogue. Um, and as I said, uh, some of the principles are based on uh, what states already do. And I think that uh, Major General uh, Siotu Bank's uh, uh, presentation was a very good example of this. But you are right, it's, it's not only about states. Um, in general, the draft principles apply to both uh, international and non-international armed conflicts. And one of the challenges after, after the finalization is to raise awareness of them among non-state armed groups and uh, persuade and help them to implement the draft principles. I, I believe civil society organizations can play a big role in this regard. Um, speaking of the environmental accountability of uh, non-state armed groups, uh, there we mainly speak of uh, what can, can be done in the way of individual criminal responsibility if they commit uh, uh, violations of IHL or violations of other uh, rules that are binding on them. But I'm sure Helen would like to continue from this. Yeah. Okay, um, Helen, please. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. And yeah. I, I would like to start uh, Ambassador at Large by saying, because I think my initial remarks were cut off because my microphone was turned off, just by saying what I what I said, which was thank you very much for those kind words uh, about the ICRC, um, and, and thank you very much uh, for that. So yes, I would like to just uh, complement a little bit also what Maria was saying um, from the side of the of the guidelines in terms of accountability, um, and and this also uh, relates to the draft principles in a way, and it's. The guidelines are very much based on uh, existing uh, obligations. Um, and to that extent, um, they are rules that are already binding and applicable to states. If I look then at the question of non-state actors, um, the guidelines address, like the ILC draft principles, uh, both international and non-international armed conflict. Then of course, um, each rule uh, within the guideline needs to be looked at to determine whether uh, that specific rule applies in an international armed conflict or in both types of conflict. But here I would, I would like to say that the majority and the large extent of these rules are applicable to non-state armed groups. I think then the question of accountability, of course, is, is one that is always um, difficult. And this is not only in terms of non-state armed groups, but also in terms of states themselves. Uh, and here I would just, um, I would uh, reiterate Maria's comment about uh, international criminal law and international criminal uh, responsibility as, as a key mechanism, uh, obviously, that can help to address some of these effects. And just to mention the guidelines, um, as I said, I think in my presentation, contain a rule that refers to the relevant international criminal law obligations um, related, uh, in this case, to the, in, to the um, investigation and if appropriate prosecution of war crimes that relate to the environment. So there's a very specific war crime related to environmental damage, but there are also a number of other war crimes uh, contained in the Rome Statute um, uh, and also in many national legislation that uh, would help uh, to hold accountable uh, in case of environmental damage. Um, so I think um, that covered a bit the different aspects if I miss something, please uh, let me know. I think there was a, also a question on, on implementation on imp and several in the chat, in the Q&A that I saw. I think there, there is a lot of state practice as Maria mentioned. Um, much of what is in the guidelines is actually based on, on our customary international humanitarian law study, uh, which are of course binding rules and, and considered customary. And there, I would encourage everyone to look at the different, the two ICRC databases on this. So there is a national implementation database that looks at um, rules, uh, how rules have been integrated into domestic legal frameworks. 
but much more of this practice is then also included um, in the underlying practice uh, of the database on customary humanitarian law. And we can share that separately uh, afterwards. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Helen. Uh, Professor Nguyen, you want to say anything on these three first three questions? Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Tommy Kohn. Uh, in my opinion, uh, law of the war uh, regulated uh, only uh, official relationship uh, between state uh, during the war, uh, international war, and uh, not non-international war. That uh, my uh, colleague, uh, Professor yes. Mazaletto, mentioned. And, and uh, now we have uh, also uh, state relationship uh, for the courts uh, that uh, to the environment uh, in the um, in the world time. However, we don't have uh, uh, any uh, provision, regulation, uh, official uh, binding on the non-state uh, uh, actor. It's like a uh, guerrilla. Uh, it's like a uh, opposition group uh, to state and a terrorist state. And uh, so that uh, all uh, actor, uh, not only state. Uh, but uh, involved from and but uh, the uh, responsible uh, to the uh, environment um, <clears throat> deterioration. Yes, yes. thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, so, we can we have another question, please? Certainly. So, there are two questions from Sandeepa Bhatt. Um, one asking if there's any specific research out there on the percentage of contribution of armed conflicts to environmental degradation and whether any, any international organization is mapping that. And as a follow-up, um, they ask, can there be a possibility of creating a global environmental reinstatement fund for damage caused by armed conflicts? Thank you. Um, would anyone in the panel like to answer these two questions? Maria, do you want to answer this question? Uh, thank you. Uh, I can at least begin. Um, in, in general, I, I believe we can say that uh, uh, peacetime activities uh, cause more damage uh, than warfare. But this, of course, does not matter that, uh, that, that does not mean that we could ignore uh, the devastation caused during conflict. One problem uh, when we speak of uh, um, particular conflicts is that there's often a lack of a baseline information from the time before conflict. So it's not possible to uh, quantify uh, the environmental damage, but it's clear and this is something that has been shown by, for instance, the post-conflict environmental assessments of the UNEP, that uh, conflicts tend to significantly uh, uh, to, to cause significant harm to the environment. Um, but as I said, uh, if, you, if you think of the global situation, uh, luckily most uh, states are in, live in, in peace and uh, peacetime activities still, still are more important. And there's one thing I, I, I think this has led to this has led to a kind of a double marginalization in the sense that protection of the environment has never been in the forefront of international humanitarian law, which of course has been focused on the protection of civilian populations. Yeah. Yeah. And armed conflicts at the same time have remained in the margin, mostly out of sight in the development of international environmental law. But I believe that we, have, we are now recognizing the interlinkages and are heading to a good direction in this regard. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, Maria. Um, in her statement earlier, uh, Nilofa referred to the 1992 real principle uh, the real declaration of principle on environment and development. I think she referred to principle number 27, which does refer to the relationship between armed conflict and the natural environment. Um, Helen, do you, want, do you have any comments on this question? 
Can you, yes, I'm not muted. Um, I think, I mean, the, the, the question of the different principles, the relationship between international environmental yeah. law and different bodies of international law um, is, is one that the guidelines uh, looks at, as I mentioned in passing, we, we, but we very much here rely on the ILC's work. Um, as you know, the ILC has, has looked in quite some detail, including uh, in uh, Professor in Ambassador Leto's uh, work, but also in previous work of the commission um, at the interaction of um, <clears throat> environmental treaties, but also other bodies of law and their continued application in armed conflict. And I think here the, the, the main message I guess I would pass is that all of these are, all of these um, bodies of international law and instruments are, are relevant to the protection of the environment and then how they specifically apply in a situation of armed conflict is something that has to be looked at uh, depending on the situation. But generally speaking in terms of international environmental law and here again I talk about the ILC work uh, and, and Maria please come in if if um, if you would like because this is more uh, your uh, expertise uh, finds that uh, there are a number of international environmental law treaties that continue to apply in the event of an armed conflict this is because they specifically say so um, some are more implicit and then there are others where it is not as clear. And there, um, it's a question of looking at whether in a specific circumstance, um, a certain rule of environmental law would potentially contradict rules of IHL uh, and how, how we look at it there. Yeah. But even where there is contradiction, it should not mean, or rather, even if there, there is a rule of international environmental law that covers more than a rule of international uh, humanitarian law, that does not necessarily mean that there is a contradiction. So it's, it's, it's quite complicated. Again, Maria, please come in if, if, I, um, if you would like. But just to say that as an overall uh, remark, uh, these instruments continue or you know, uh, rules of customary law continue to apply in the event of an armed conflict. The question is how and which. Okay, thank you, Helen. I think Maria would like to make an additional point. So, Maria, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, I forgot to comment on the question about the fund and wanted to mention that one of the IOC's draft principles actually uh, highlights the possibility for states uh, to establish a fund uh, for uh, the restoration of the environment after a conflict. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Professor Nguyen. In your earlier statement, you talk about joint action taken by Vietnam and the United States to remedy in, I think, two places in Vietnam, the effects of orange, Asian or Agent Orange. Could you, would you like to elaborate a bit more about what, what other joint actions have been taken by Vietnam and the United States to remedy the environmental consequences of the war. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Professor um, uh, Tomiko. Mm. As uh, earlier, I uh, remind you that uh, 3 million Vietnamese are victims of uh, Asian Orange. So that is uh, about uh, 5 or 10 percent of uh, Vietnamese population. Yeah. So uh, it's a uh, uh, great uh, damage goods by the armed conflicts uh, to the environment and also to the Vietnamese uh, yeah. population. Yeah. 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 And however, uh, you know that uh, we, we have not uh, opened the lawsuit against the American army because it is a very sensitive political issue. Yeah. However, we, we, we propose uh, the cooperation and uh, they also uh, uh, support us as the equipment uh, and uh, uh, financial uh, shocks uh, to clean up uh, two area around the uh, airport, Bien Hoa and Da Nang. Uh, that place uh, where the uh, B-52 uh, yeah. carry out the uh, Asian oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, to ground. Yeah. So I, I think that is a, is a symbol uh, yeah. to uh, yeah, minimize the damage and uh, also the uh, yeah. minimize the hostility between the two um, uh, pastor armies, uh, yeah. uh, enemies. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, <laughs> it's um, 
I think mm. already 4.40. So we time, we time for one more question. A last question. Please give us a very challenging question. Oh my, I'm not sure whether <laughs> I would uh, identify this um, accurately, but there is an interesting question about the place of indigenous peoples. Um, and this is from Fred Lubang, um, noting that the ICRC guidelines, protection of the environment during armed conflict and the ILC principles align with the right to self-determination of indigenous peoples of their ancestral domain, which is about protection of the natural environment. And uh, the, the question does go on longer, but I think um, what's interesting here is the question of like how the space of specific communities and indigenous peoples might play might come into play here? Uh, the relevance is not obvious to me, but let me, let me run it by all the panelists. Um, Maria, is this relevant to your work? Thank you. Yes, uh, the Commission has recognized that uh, the protection based on existing international <clears throat> instruments of the territories of indigenous peoples yeah. has a lot of relevance for the protection of the environment in times of armed conflict. Uh, this, is an, this is a draft principle that was presented already in 2016. Oh. So it has been discussed several times in the UN General Assembly. And I must say first time when it was presented and there were not yet commentaries available, many states uh, reacted in the same way as you did. Say, saying that they don't see the connection. But it has been recognized uh, increasingly since then. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Uh, Helen, any comment on this? Yes, thank you very much. This is, uh, and that's, uh, thank you for the question. This is actually one of those areas where we precisely see uh, the complementarity between the ILC draft principles and the guidelines playing out uh, very clearly, because this is something that the, the ICRC guidelines does not look at in detail. Of course, IHL uh, does not uh, <laughs> include any specific protect, uh, provisions on the protection of the environment of indigenous peoples. That's not to say that the, the rules of IHL would not be relevant, and, and indeed they would be. Uh, indigenous peoples are, are, of course, part of the civilian population, um, and, and the environment itself is, as I mentioned, civilian in character. So these rules would, would uh, protect, but I think, uh, uh, as I said, specifically on um, indigenous peoples, their contribution and, and um, the environment in relation to that. It's really something the ILC draft principles uh, look yep. at and that we see as very complementary precisely to our work because we don't go into those. Um, okay. those Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before we conclude, I'd like to go around the panel and ask each panelist to say in about a minute or so, what is the most important message they want to leave with us today? So I will begin with General Sumatopang. General, what's the most important message you want to give us today? Um, the, 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 the important message that I would like to highlight is that the, all, um, uh, say, the military should be deployed to overseas, should have the uh, knowledge of how to treat yeah. the environmental in the conflict area, yeah. uh, as we did what we uh, carried out here in training center, then we deploy to uh, the region. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's a good message. All the militaries of the world should emulate the good practice of Indonesia. Um, Professor Nguyen, yeah. do you have a message for us? Yeah, I, I have a message that uh, uh, prevent uh, any armed conflict. conflict. is uh, our great concern. And uh, <laughs> if, uh, it is uh, unavoidable, so protection of environment during armed conflict is the obligation of all, not Thank only you. state, but all. Thank you. That's a very good message. Thank you. Uh, mm. Helen, Helen, can I have a powerful message from you? Yes, thank you. I will try to make it powerful. <laughs> uh, I think uh, my main message uh, would be that, of course, there is much environmental damage that happens uh, in armed conflict and that is not regulated by IHL. So I think it's critical to situate the guidelines and the I I and IHL rules within the wider network and to not um, forget that there are many relevant rules um, of, of law outside of uh, IHL 
and also in peacetime, as Maria mentioned, uh, there is much environmental damage that happens also outside of armed conflict. So I think my main message would be the environment is protected by a wide range of international law rules that all are relevant. And then when it comes to IHL specifically, because of course I have to pass a message on that, uh, our, our call is really to uh, look at the guidelines and use them as a tool uh, to integrate uh, IHL rules that protect the environment into national laws, domestic practice, um, military manuals, but more importantly, actually use them, apply them in practice. And we're happy to help uh, and to support in doing that. Thanks. So thank you very thank much. Thank you, uh, Maria. Uh, a message from you, please. Thank you. Now I got my microphone. Um, since we are still in the first reading uh, process, I, I hope we will achieve the best possible outcome in terms of content and in terms of impact. And the cons uh, consultation, yeah. consultations with states, international organizations and others are quite important in this regard. I, I really hope that uh, the process of submitting written comments will be as inclusive as possible. This is, this is critical for the implementation of the final product and uh, for the ability of the final principles to provide guidance to these different actors and help them uh, to take measures that really enhance the protection of the environment in relation to armed conflicts. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Maria. Um, finally, I want to call on Nilufa. Nilufa, can you share with us your concluding thoughts of this particular seminar? Uh, thank you so much. Well, first of all, I have to say that we've had uh, really a very rich uh, and informative um, presentation of what I think is groundbreaking work. Um, Helen said that the environment can no longer be considered a silent casualty of armed conflict. I couldn't agree more. Um, Mario highlighted a very important point as well, uh, and the others that instead of two separate branches, IHL law and environmental law, that these have to be integrated now. Um, the environment we know impacts human lives. And this has been brought out, the experience from Vietnam, three million people, that 10% of the population. And the Vietnam War ended a long time ago <laughs> and it's still there. These are long lasting impacts. Um, and, and I think the example from Indonesia that was given to us was absolutely critical, yeah. uh, best practices. Um, it's so important. So this is not a theoretical issue. It's very sad. We are still in a world of armed conflict and we cannot separate the well-being of the world from the environment. And so the work of the ILC, which I've also been involved in, and I really encourage our audience to look at it. It is really very groundbreaking. And I do hope that at the second reading, it will not change too much because <laughs> particularly on there's some very important issues and also on the ICRC guidelines. Um, so this is continuing. I hope that with the ICRC and the CIL, we will continue to monitor these, as I say, very important developments in armed conflict and protection of the environment. Um, so those would be my, my uh, final thought. Yeah. Thank you, Nilusa. So I will just conclude by saying that um, this year is the 75th anniversary of the founding of the UN. And I want to echo what Professor Nguyen said just now in his powerful concluding message. In 1945, when the founding members of the UN gathered in San Francisco, the one ideal that motivated them above all else was to save succeeding generation from the scourge of war. We have failed very badly in this respect, but I, I, I associate myself with Professor Nguyen and saying that we must avoid armed conflict at any cost. And if armed conflict is inevitable, <clears throat> then we must protect not only civilian population, but also the natural environment. And therefore, in this respect, we support very strongly the updated guidelines of ICRC 
And I want to tell the, uh, Maria that we also support the noble efforts of ILC in formulating this drug principle on the protection of the natural environment in relation to armed conflict. So thank you. And I will ask Tsui to bring us to a happy conclusion. Thank you, Professor Ko. Uh, I'd just like to see if perhaps Nilifer would like to say a word first. Thank you. Um, just in concluding, again, I just want to thank, first of all, uh, our very able moderator who really has uh, brought out the best of this panel, our excellent speakers. Uh, I know there were many, many questions and I have to thank the audience for uh, their interest. Uh, it's really very rewarding because it's a very specialized area. And so I we were absolutely delighted to see there's such a strong interest. And I invite the audience to stay with us. We will continue with the ICRC. We have plans for the future to continue looking at issues. Um, and I also am very grateful for our um, ambassador Phileas as well for joining us. And, and, and Switzerland is such an important uh, state both for the ICRC and also for the ILC, it hosts us. So thank you to all. And please, I, I thank the participants for your uh, interest and stay with us. We will continue working on these issues together. Thank you so much. I can only add more thanks to everyone and to let you know that the recording of this event will be available on the CIL website as well as our YouTube channel, where you'll also be able to find the recording of a lecture that took place just this week on the 11th of November on contemporary challenges in international humanitarian law, which was delivered by Dr. Cordula Jurga, the chief uh, legal officer of the ICRC. To find out more about other upcoming CIL events and our activities, please do follow us uh, on our mailing list via our website, on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Thank you very much, everyone. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Yeah.